Tonight, we have the privilege of having Larry Namer join us. Larry is ju not just a serial entrepreneur, but is a co the co-founder of E! Entertainment Television. You might have heard of them. Might have spent many hours of your life watching the shows. A $3.5 a $3 billion brand. But not only that, not only do you have a successful exit with that, he's now starting a new venture. He has a, a won't stop, a can't stop, won't stop attitude. And I'm excited to hear his journey because it's 100% applicable to what we're doing here. So with that said, please give Larry a proper start. Brian, welcome. These chairs are really comfortable, just so you know. <laughs> it is really easy to get really comfortable in this. So, Larry, I hope you felt the excitement from, from our community here. Um, it is an absolute honor to have you. I, from the moment you accepted it, I've been excited about this month. I've been excited to hear your story um, and to apply it to our community. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. Uh, it's great to be here. I mean, for me, it's a great change. Because usually when people go, he's the Kardashian guy, and I get booed. Uh, this is kind of nice, thank you. <laughs> I love that. So, Starbuck Brand's a little different than maybe some other speaking engagements that you've had, but what our focus is about hearing the entrepreneurial journey. So obviously, E is a big thing and probably a big draw for a lot of people here, but we know you have a starting point that is earlier than that. So, let's focus on your journey from the beginning. Tell us where it starts, you know, your family dynamic, uh, what did your parents do? Were they entrepreneurs? Where did you go to school? Tell us from the beginning the Larry story. Sure. Um, grew up in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, <laughs> father was a Pepsi Cola truck driver. Uh, mom worked with the Department of Social Services. Uh, I was the first person ever to go to college in the family because I was beaten into going. Uh, you know, family were immigrants. Um, my father was, comes from Turkey. And um, you know, they just decided that their kids were going to have a better life than they did, and just literally and figuratively beat it. Beat it <laughs> and um, <clears throat> so I went to college, graduated Brooklyn College, degree in economics. Uh, thought I would teach. Uh, found out that the city in, of New York and I didn't see eye to eye on history and things like that. So I quickly, uh, quickly got out of that and uh, needed a job. So somebody I knew was in the electricians union, and I said, I just want to do something for the summer, but kind of mindless until I figure out what do you do with an economics degree. Um, so they said, oh, we just organized these guys. It's so called cable TV. I'm not sure what it is, but go see this guy. And I went and um, I took a job in New York, <clears throat> literally, so the, I started below the ground up. I was an underground splicer. I used to lift the manholes in New York City go underground, work with the rats all day, put the cables together, and then at five o'clock you'd come out and you'd, you'd go home. Uh, but it was, it was a great time to be there, um, and there was a lot to be said for being in the right place at the right time. Besides, the company was bought by Time Incorporated, which at that point was a publishing company, the magazines and books. Um, so they bought this company, and you know, so you had the, the Harvard and Yale guy sitting up on 6th Avenue, and then you had this company that they bought, you know, which uh, clearly I was the only one with a college degree, and I possibly was the only one with high school. Um, so they didn't know how to talk to each other until someone in HR said, hey, wait a second, there's a guy that knows, you know, knows what a balance sheet is. And so, so I kind of became the go-between between the management and stuff. But it was, it was a great time to be there because time had made a very conscious decision to move from being a publishing company to becoming a media company. And they set out a time year, a ten year time frame, and um, so I was fortunate enough to be part of the group that you know started Urban Cable and HBO and Cinemax and channels and all of that stuff. So you were a part of the start of, of HBO. Yeah, actually, my last office in Manhattan at one point was all of HBO. The entire company was in that room. I love how you just rolled over. I was part of HBO. <laughs> I can't tell you how many hours of my life I have probably spent on things that you were a part of. This is this is incredible. So, 
you get that, you, you graduate, you come from an immigrant family, and again, I mean, the amount of, of, of hustle it takes and, and effort and persistence and dedication to, to, to not only just, you know, move your family to a new country and to raise them, there's, you obviously have that inspiration from your parents as far as that, that work ethic. You know, is that, is, is that, is that ring true? Yeah, definitely. I mean, like I say, my parents would work two and three jobs because they were just determined that the kids would grow up to be, you know, to have a better life than they. And actually, what's interesting, because, the, you know, I came from what, well, at least now we see was a lower, lower class uh, area in Brooklyn. And, but even to this day, the high school I went to, it's a public high school, it's got more Nobel Prize winners than any other high school in America. Um, and it wasn't because there was something in the water. There was something, there was something in the neighborhood that just drove us. That's been fantastic. So you, you graduate college, you get you get connected with time, you come from you come from the sewers to the corporate office. Uh, tell us about some of that time with time. The time with time. Well, you know, it was fun for me because you know time was a very traditional company and you know, people at the level that you know I, I ended up in, you know, I was in my twenties and I was managing all of operations in Manhattan Cable, like 300 and something people, and then time decided to buy cable companies, and they'd say, here's the corporate jet, go and buy us some cable systems, and literally gave me a check for like $300 million to sell and spend, and you know. So I, I, got to, I got to do things very young that most people in that timing family didn't really get to do until they were 50. So, and nobody knew if you knew what you were doing or not because nobody ever did it before. So, you know, it was fun. And then um, it was there, you know, I was on the operations side. So everything from the guys that worked in the sewers to the, uh, the installers that worked in the homes, to the servicemen, to the engineers, all of that reported to me. And, um, and then when HBO started, uh, nobody really knew anything about production. So they would say to me, Larry, could you fly to Cleveland this weekend? We're shooting something with this woman named Bette Midler. Can you go there and make sure that they're not stealing our money? <laughs> yeah, I could do that. Uh, so, I, so I got exposed to a lot of stuff like really early on and, and stuff. And that's kind of what gave me the confidence to just eventually go off and do it myself. So those years with time sound very entrepreneurial, where you were given lines of business to run, lines of business to grow, I mean, HBO, for goodness sake, right? Um, why, and obviously a ton of resources that come from time. So why the, the need or desire to leave that situation to start your own thing? Well, I, my, actually the last thing I did while I was still in that timing family, uh, they put me in charge of corporate development which was to figure out new ways to use the cable wire other than just bringing in good reception. Um, so <clears throat> I just bought books and learned about bits and bytes and things like that. We started doing um, data communications, uh, moving data or phone calls up and down Manhattan. Um, and, and I built a division there, which was um, the non-entertainment division. And within two years, we actually made more money from the non-entertainment stuff that I was doing then from what they would make on all those cable channels and stuff like that. Uh, but what had happened was the, um, all of a sudden cities decided that cable is more than just good perception. Cable can do a lot of things. And uh, the big cities wanted a franchise cable, but they want the cable, they didn't want cable to be on the phone line, on the phone poles like they are in rural areas. They want everything to go underground. Well, at that point, there was only one underground system built in the country, and that was Manhattan, and I did it. So I found myself getting recruited, um, you know, at the ripe old age of 30, you know, with, with companies offering me literally four and five times what I was making uh, to come move out here. And um, so I did that. I, I built the San Fernando Valley Cable System, um, Valley Cable, uh, which was the first 61 channel two-way cable system ever built in the U.S. Uh, at that time, 61 channels was a lot. That was, that was a little. Um, but you know, I got to do that. So that's where my skills actually broadened from being in the operations guy to understanding finance and programming and things like that. We, we were actually named by Forbes magazine as the, um, the model for local cable programming. 
uh, globally, uh, well, well, domestically, anyway. Um, so I was there, and we were we were bidding on other franchises, um, some around this area and some in the Atlanta area. And it was a little company from Canada that I was working for, and um, we decided that you know maybe we'd win two or three and stuff. So we bid 15 or 16, and um, but we won 15 and 16, <laughs> and uh, because we're doing all this great programming that everybody you know was kind of amazed. And then finally, the bank woke up and said, hey guys, you know, you're 98% debt. You gotta put a little bit of money into this deal. And of course, none of us had any money. So the Canadians went back to Canada and wanted me to come with them. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I didn't go from Brooklyn to LA to go to Canada, Toronto. <laughs> so, uh, so that's why I, I stayed there. And I said, you know what? I think it's time that I really thought, I'm making money for a lot of people. Like, how do I do it for me? And a friend of mine and, and I, we just started kicking around ideas. And at that time, people were, um, the big saying was cable TV is like an electronic newspaper. And you know, CNN is the, the headlines, and ESPN is the sports, and home shopping is the, the classifieds. And Alan and I just kept looking at each other and go, wait a second, the second most read of any newspaper is the entertainment pages. Where is that? And it was clearly missing. So we said, well, let's just raise some money and we'll start that. Um, little did we know that it's not quite that, that easy. And um, so we wrote a business plan and spent three and a half years where people said, you know, that's a good idea, but you're not Rupert Murdoch. You can't wake up in the morning and start a TV network. And like I said, we were a little bit dumb. And we went, well, why not? Um, and eventually we raised. At that time, the going rate to start a cable network was around 60 million US. Um, we, we found a, a guy, an investment banker in New York, young guy who had just got this job, who loved it, said, I really love this, I'm gonna give you money. And we jumped up and down, he said, but I'm only allowed to sign for two million. <laughs> what, what do we do with two million dollars? 60. He goes, I'm only allowed to sign for two. And I go, yeah, but we need 60. And he goes, but I can only sign for two. So I said, you know what? Give me the two. Um, and, uh, and I was actually telling James the story. A friend of mine was teaching radio, television, film at the University of Texas in Austin. And I called him up and I said, Brian, do you have any kids that need intern jobs? And he said, yeah, we got a lot for the summer. How many do you need? I go, as many as you could send. So we went to the apartments in Hollywood, bought a bunch of mattresses. He sent me 31 kids from Texas. <laughs> Only 15 never went back. Um, so we, we started the company with 11 employees and 31 interns. And only 3% of what your target raise was. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so that, that brings us to obviously the e-chapter, and I think that raise story is one I'd like to kind of sit on just for a little bit because it's so relevant to today. I mean, again, this was, uh, what, this was mid-80s, right? This is 84. 84. 84 to 87. 84 to 87. Because um, one thing about that raise is it wasn't easy for you to come by. You, you said you mentioned you spent, what, three years? Three, three and a half years before anybody would give us a dime. Yeah. yeah. So looking back on, on raising money then versus now, what are some of the differences you see, if any, on what it was like to raise money then versus now? Well, I think, you know, if, if you're going to go out as, as an independent, you're always going to face that skepticism, you know? I mean, like, what we used to hear is, well, you're not Rupert Murdoch, and, you know, if you're trying to start a tech company, it's like, you know, you know Steve Jobs, or, you know, Bill Gates, or stuff like that. And, you know, you just, if you really believe in your project, and, and one of the things that people always ask Alan and I, they go, when did you know it was going to be such a big success? And we said, from the first day we thought of it. I mean, we never had any doubts. We knew what it was going to be. Um, nobody else did, but so it took a while to educate some people. Took a lot of Kardashians. <laughs> <laughs> so I know we have, uh, I, I personally know, in this room, we probably have four startups that are two years in and raised probably close to nothing. This is a great, relevant case to say stay on the grind. Because at some point, Someone gets it. I mean, that, that one guy got it, right? Yeah, that, the one guy got. Well, we, you know, we walked into the office. The guy had just gotten his job. 
and this was in New York, and you know, the young guy and he had movie posters all over the wall, and we just looked at each other and we go, here it is, here's the money. Uh, little did we know that it was only going to be two million, but we found the guy that got it. Um, yeah, but then, then what well, we did, we, we now it's not quite that easy. We did get pretty inventive, and you know, I, I explained the business model to you, which. The please, please share that in detail right now. It is unbelievable. So, you know, with $2 million and a lot of interns, we couldn't do a lot of programming. So we said, you know what, the best part of a, a movie is the movie trailer. But you only see the movie trailer when you're in the movies. So we said, why don't we do like MTV of the movies? So instead of, you know, when Madonna has a new video, it's like and Schwarzenegger has a new movie. Uh, you know, where you point to a green screen, where you're getting you know, an asset from $50 million, you're getting for free, <clears throat> and you're basically standing up a host. And the answer is yes, we were, but it wasn't just all luck. To get the first four hosts, when you think of the hosts, Greg Kinnear went on to be Academy Award, uh, Julie Moran, first woman to do Wide World of Sports, Katie Wagner did Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous, Mark DiCarlo did Studs, you know, and then we had Brooke Burke, Howard Stern, you know, we, we kind of grew from there. It, it wasn't luck. We knew that we don't make the movies, so we have no control over that. All that we really can control is the hosts that present the trailers and the other parts of the movies. So to get the, um, so to pick the first four hosts, we interviewed over 10,000 people, and we actually put 7,200 people on tape. Uh, and Greg Kinnear was the first one we hired, who was never on television before in his life. But we knew when we saw Greg that Greg was going to go on to bigger and better things. And that, that's kind of what propelled it. But then in <clears throat> the business world, I would talk to publicists for the movies. And, you know, go, hey, when you got the new Schwarzenegger movie, you don't really have a problem. But what are you going to do with Jaws 5? And then I'm like, oh, yeah, Jaws 5, that's a problem. I said, OK, you give me all the materials from the Schwarzenegger movie, and I'll give you half an hour for Jaws 5. So they were like, whoa, that's great, because now I can tell my clients and my boss that I found a way to publicize these bad movies. Um, I wouldn't care because she was watching, other than my mother, who was watching the channel anyway. Um, so we started out with the host of basically introducing movie trailers. And then I would go to the, the publicist and say, you know, well, while you're shooting the movie, why don't you send the video crew and shoot the behind the scenes, the making of the music, the interviews. And they were like, well, nobody puts it on TV. I said, you shoot it, I'll put it on TV. So we would give them that. They would give us all that material. And then separately, I would go to the advertising department in the studio and go, I've got two million people that are watching this channel because they love the movies. You should be advertising here. And they would then buy advertising on the channel. It took them two years to figure out they were giving me the material for free that I was charging them to advertise. <laughs> but by that time, we had built up and you know, then, then we started and you know, we brought in uh, we started with a lot of my crazier ideas, like, you know, the first one that really broke through for us <clears throat> was Talk Soup. Um, you know, and when I told people, I said, I want to do a TV show that makes fun of TV shows. And they kind of looked at me and they were going, oh, really? Uh, you know, Talk Soup ran for 26 years. Um, and um, 120 something countries. And, you know, and then the next one was like, I got a really good idea. I want to do a TV show about a radio show. They're going, no, no, radio went out like 50 years ago. I said, no, no, I'm going to bring it back. And so we did Howard Stern. But when you think about Howard Stern, it was KRP in Cincinnati. You know, to us, it was like, no, it was KRP in Cincinnati. I mean, we didn't invent it. It was this crazy group that had a radio show. And we just turned cameras on the radio show. And Howard did the rest. And you know, then we did Wild On and the Hollywood True Stories and stuff. By that time, we had viewers and revenue and all that kind of stuff. I love when you first mentioned that to me, the creativity and the revenue. So I think we we heard a little bit of this story last month as well, not this video story, but the idea of that entrepreneurial hustle to be creative. Again, you were you were given three percent of the raise to start and you started a cable network from it because you were determined and you created a revenue model that was very advantageous and very creative to take the lesser known films and their content and monetize with an audience. And I think for for all of us here, I think that idea of being creative to drive revenue is something that we, we kind of get landlocked in, right? It's, 
oh, most people that works well, we have content, we sell advertising. But you're like, no, I'm not, I'm gonna do this. And it changed the landscape for you. Yeah. And then now we do much weirder stuff, but I'll tell you about that after. <laughs> So what, when you when you got that raise, and I, I'm spending time on that because like I said I know you know four companies in here that are um, in the midst of fundraising. When you got that raise, that was well below your expectation. What changed in your plan and your execution, right? Because execution is key, especially. I mean, execution is key if you already gotten all the money, but it's especially critical because you only got three percent of that money. So please share your thoughts on how you executed and just the. Like, your thoughts on execution period. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, we, we identified some sources of really high quality programming that people desired. I mean, you think about it, movie trailers are a lot of times are better than the movie itself. <laughs> so it gave us a way to really provide a product um, that was very economical to provide, but yet had high yield in terms of revenue. Uh, again, if you spend a million dollars on a TV show, and you get a one rating, you're going to get the same advertising as if you spend a dollar on the program and you get a one rating. So, you know, it's all based on eyeballs. So the, 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 the best set of economics were the ones you always opted for. And for us, what that really did was it forced us into a lot of creative thinking. We said, okay, what comes after movie trailers? I mean, literally, we did this. We said, let's do red carpet. But nobody would ever let us on a red carpet. So they're doing the Academy Awards. Literally, we climbed over the fence, <laughs> threw the camera over. I was the grip, um, and we shot red carpet there, and then you know put it on. And everything we did, because we didn't have money, we looked really pirate. So people were like feeling they were seeing something they're not supposed to see, um, and stuff. So so we we did a lot of the red carpet and stuff like that, and then then we would just do. <clears throat> inventive things like, um, like when Paula Abdul was, you know, Paula was doing, uh, she was cheerleading, you know, teaching the, the Lakers how to do cheerleading, dancing, and stuff like that. Paula goes, oh, I can be a host. We're going, no, you can't. She goes, oh, I'll tell her, tell me I can be a host. I went, turn the lights on in the studio. Let this, let her, let her go host. So we did. We we took a lot of chances on stuff. And I mean, the thing that really broke us through in, in the Hollywood community. <clears throat> and again, we had a studio, which is not really a studio. We, we rented the railway station in Hollywood. Um, and literally, the voiceover booth was the, uh, the closet in the conference room. So if you wanted to use the conference room, you had people walking in to go do voiceovers and stuff like that. But um, I think the one that really broke us out got us noticed that the Hollywood community, in, in the select community, um, we talked to um, uh, the, the manager of uh, Tony Curtis and, uh, oh, no, I'm sorry, Jack Lemon. And we said we'd love to have Jack on do an interview. He said, Jack doesn't do interviews. So he said, no, no, we're doing this thing that uh, we need Jack to do and Jack doesn't do interviews. He goes, you know, I'm being a Brooklyn kid. I'm like, yeah, okay, what does Jack do? He goes, Jack loves to play the piano. I said, great. I'll put a piano on the set. Jack can come in for an hour and play the piano. No questions. So the manager said, what do you mean? I said, let him come in and play whatever he wants. He doesn't have to say a word. He can play the piano and leave. Nobody will ask him a single question. So he said, if you guarantee us that, we'll do it. So we brought a piano in, and uh, Jack was there and kept looking around, waiting for somebody to start asking him questions, because he didn't believe we were just going to let him play. <laughs> and um, you know, then after about a half an hour, Jack just felt really good and started talking, started talking <laughs> directly to the audience in a way that he never had before. And people just found it amazing that we got, not, not just did we get Jack to come to the studio, but we got Jack to talk about life and his passions and stuff like that. And any manager that saw it was like, oh, wait a second, you know, could you do that for John Head? Could you do that for this one? So he started calling us, knowing that we would, we would always do things that are a little bit off the, the beaten path. Um, so we, we did that, and then the other thing that really broke us out, and again it comes from my Brooklyn side, is uh, we had Greg, Greg Kinnear <clears throat> doing uh, the countdown, and the number 10 movie of the week was that of that from Disney, and the number 9 was that of that from Universal, and the only studio that wasn't cooperating with us was Paramount, they wouldn't give us anything, they wouldn't advertise with anything, so when there would be a Paramount movie, 
I was just having Greg go. And the number six movie is from, ah, some studio star to repeat, forget it, not worth saying. <laughs> the president of Paramount just literally couldn't take, just went down to his marketing department and said, I don't care what you have to do. I want that stuff. <laughs> and they became an ass president. So I know you said that you knew he was going to be a success from the time you and Al, your partner Alan had that idea. But at what point did you know that it was a sustainable business? Um, <clears throat> well, when we went on the air, uh, you know, first you spend, you know, two months getting ready to go on the air, and you're going, okay, another week left, and five days left, four days left, whatever, and then you flip the switch and it goes on the air, and you go, Phew. We did it, and then you go, oh shit, now I gotta do it every day for the rest of my life. <laughs> uh, you know, because once you start it, it just never goes away. It's on all the time. Um, but as soon as it went on, everybody said, oh, why didn't you tell us that's what you want to do? We would have given you money three years ago. Um, <clears throat> it, it was, like I say, it was just so obvious to us. The audience loved it. It was so different than anything. You know, it wasn't structured from a big media company. It, it looked different, it felt different. Um, it appealed very differently to people. So that was kind of it. So then at what point did it turn from the scrappy pirate business to a legit, we'll say a legitimate network in the eyes of Hollywood? Um, after about three years, I mean, we, we actually started under the name Movie Time. Uh, and then we changed the name uh, Of course, we thought it would be broader you know, than just movies. And, um, but it was probably after three years, um, all the cable operators came to us and, you know, basically said, hey, you know, we love this because they began to figure out with our help uh, <laughs> that, um, that the more people knew of the movies that were in the theater, the more value they placed on their movie services. Like if you watched it, and it's very simple, if you got the guide for HBO and you never heard of the movies, it could be the best movies ever, but you go, I never heard of these movies, bad luck and you didn't feel like sending in your $10 to the cable company. But if you heard of the movies, even if you didn't watch them, it changed the perceived value of those movies. So cable operators, we started doing a lot of surveys, now that we have a little money, showing that somebody who watches E was a better cable subscriber than someone who didn't. And so we could really prove to them in dollars and cents, and they jumped all over that. And they were like, this is great, you gotta do more. And we go, we have no money. They go, how much do you want? And you know, then they just kept piling money in. So, I mean, and, and this is uh, a little off the cuff, just because you mentioned the HBO reference there. What were the different ways in which you were in the early days you monetized? I mean, what your revenue streams? I think most of us think cable network would be advertising. What were the various ways that you were able to monetize your business? Yeah, we um, money money came from several ways. Um, Number one, advertising was clearly the, the biggest part. Uh, but then we got fees from the cable operator because we started to build the case why a viewer of the channel was more valuable to that cable company. They would stay a cable subscriber longer. They would get more movie services, whatever. And then we turned around and started charging the cable operators to actually carry it. So they would pay us, you know, 10 cents a month per home to carry it. You know, and you got 30, 40, 50 million homes. It's a lot of money. Uh, you know, 50 million homes at 10 cents, it's $5 million a month. We couldn't figure out how you spend that. And, and I, excuse me, I asked that question because, again, back to this entrepreneurial journey, it's, it's being creative in that monetizing space, right? What are the ways in which we can generate revenue? Because a sustainable business is not just because we get a lump sum investment, right? It's, it's how do we maintain the day-to-day -day operations and how can we sustain ourselves beyond the investment. And I think a lot of times we get locked into our business plan as to, well, this is what my business is going to be, and therefore this is the path I stay on because this business plan got me this money. Well, you, as you start going about this, you've got to be scrapping. You've got to start thinking of different ways, and that's why I, I was... Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we started, um, I mean, we then said, hey, you know, people who love Hollywood don't just come from the U.S. So we literally, in the first year when we were alive, we, um, we then went to 14 countries. So he was in 14 different countries in that first year. Uh, I think after three years, we were in about 40 countries. Today we're in 121 countries. So 
the love of how we realize we have a global product. So those people pay that, that fee and we get advertising money, you know, from, from all of that. And uh, yeah, but then all of a sudden the online world emerged and we went, oh, you online? Sure. You know, you know, we started getting involved in merchandising and stuff like that. So we, we really looked at every single way to get a penny out of that. So, and I think that's a great snapshot of you. And, I, and, I, and what I love about your story is, like I mentioned earlier, it's just can't stop, won't stop. And you have an entirely other chapter because you can't stop. You just, you, you love it. And so in 2000, I believe it was 2007, you uh, sold E, correct? Yeah. Okay. So in 2007, you sold E, but looking back on that, before we jump into uh, your new venture, looking back on that journey, uh, what are some key learnings that you still hang on to today from that entire process? Well, I mean, the, the first thing is revenue, revenue, revenue. Uh, everybody thinks, oh, we raised $10 million and they just think of ways to spend it. We really focus on how not to spend it and stuff, and that's what kept us alive through those initial periods. Most, most of the startups that I see that go under, it's, you know, they buy air on chairs for $700 and stuff like that. When I, whenever I rent new offices, I always look for the startup that just went under, because somebody just put like millions into the renovation uh, and, um, and stuff like that. It's just concern, it's really focusing on conserving that cash and how to generate revenue. I mean, this whole thing, we'll, we'll just build it, eventually they'll come, you know, to me is BS. I don't believe in that. I, don't, I, don't, I think, sure, there are places it has happened, but most have failed because of that kind of thinking. I love that air on chairs, is that the phrase? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. 700 bucks a chair, we can buy these for $14 at Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> so, you sell at 07. Now, what, when did you know what your next venture was going to be? Um, well, after we sold, obviously we made a little bit of money. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, now and I just kind of laughed at, you know, at that. And, uh, but I said, okay, that's it, I'm done, I'm going to play golf. I never played golf in my life. That lasted about two weeks. Uh, but, okay, this is not for me. Um, so, you know, I started looking for that next challenge, and and even while I was at E, I, I started to do a lot of stuff. I loved doing stuff out of the country. I just felt that the days that the U.S. was the center of the media world were, were, were numbered, that it was not going to stay that way forever. When we used to start <clears throat> media business plans, it would kind of wait of 90% U.S., 10% the rest of the world. Now it's like 30% U.S., 70% the rest of the world. Um, so I, I really put my focus on doing stuff out of the U.S., um, so I did that, I got very comfortable with doing stuff. Separately, I started a company in Russia. I had crazy, I, had a, I did a soap opera in Russia that was the number one, it was on five days a week, it was the number one TV show in Russia for 10 years. Um, and I don't speak Russian. Um, <laughs> but it was human, you know, it's human values, you know, love and business and cheating and, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, and also the, someone's uh, tweeting that, human values, love, <laughs> cheating. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, for me, the other thing that it did, for me, particularly dealing in Russia, it kind of eliminated my fear of communism as the boogeyman. Uh, you know, now when you mention the word communism, we think that monsters are going to come out of the closet and eat us and stuff like that. And I really got to understand, like, that mentality of where it comes from and stuff like that. And then, you know, in, in 09, I just said, okay, where could I go that's really gonna be a challenge? I said, let me go to a country that I've never been to, where I don't speak the language, I didn't grow up in, and let me create television shows, particularly comedy, for those people. So I went to China. <coughs> and, uh, you know, other than the occasional Chinese restaurant that I used to eat, I had no connection to China, but I just figured, number one, it's a challenge, and number two, it's where Rupert can't find me. I, I kinda, I, I like a Rupert Murdoch for the devil. You know, it's, it's, you know, I so said, where, where can I go where I'm on equal footing with Rupert Murdoch? And places where they shun Rupert were the places that I like to go because I, I can do it. I've got more shows on television in China than Fox does or Warner does or, or anything because they don't really care who they are. Um, 
And as a matter of fact, they, they're much more open to dealing with someone like me, who they realize doesn't have this political agenda. I'm not looking to read Chinese culture and you know, make sure that this is the way we do it in Hollywood, this is the way you must do it here and stuff. So I, I've been in China, we've been building this business in China for a number of years now. And that business uh, is Meitan Global Entertainment Group, correct? Yeah. And uh, share a little bit about your vision for Meitan. Yeah, we, we started out in the TV world on, in broadcast. Um, the first show we put on, um, a low-hanging fruit, hello, Hollywood. Uh, so the e-news daily, but done in Chinese. So what does the Chinese audience want to know about what goes on in Hollywood? Very different than what a US audience. And one of the reasons I wanted to get out of the country is that that kind of reporting has become very vicious in the US. Uh, it's TMZ. It's let me go find someone drunk in the street, and I'll ruin their life and their career, and stuff like that. He, he, when he started, in, when it was under us, it was really a celebration of, of the industry and celebrity and stuff. So I couldn't do that. I had too many friends. I was not going to go out and try and ruin people's lives and, and do that. And Chinese people, the difference, if you were to interview Tom Cruise here, you know, it would be, so tell us about Scientology and, you know, stuff like that. When you interview him for China, it's what do you do with your kids on the weekend? So much easier for me to do that kind of stuff. So we had a big show. Uh, Hello Hollywood or Hello Hollywood um, ran uh, uh, almost eight years in China. Um, so we just got sick of it. We killed it. It was still doing okay, but we just got tired of doing it. We kind of killed it off. We just wanted to do other stuff. Um, so we, we started doing that. We then started, we got into scripted drama, um, things like the equivalent of Gossip Girl. So instead of spoiled rich girls in New York, it's spoiled rich girls in Shanghai. Uh, and actually, from a business model point of view, uh, that one's interesting because in the show, a girl wears great shoes. You know, oh, those great shoes, where you get them? I get them on sparkle.com. Three episodes later, great shoes. I told you I get them on sparkle.com. We actually own sparkle.com. We employ a shoe designer, and we have a shoe factory. We make more money selling shoes than we make on the TV show. Uh, the NBC guys give me a lot of stuff like that these days. They're like, Larry, you're a shoe salesman. I don't know. Uh, so you can be very inventive with business models in places where it's really just beginning. Because there's no, there's no legacy stuff. It's not legacy technology. It's not legacy business models. You're starting from the beginning. Um, so you get a lot more leeway uh, to do stuff. So we went from scripted. Um, we started doing some reality, um, probably even to this day, you know, people say, well, what do you think is your biggest accomplishment? You know, the E shows to me were just logic, you know, it's like people love gossip, you know, I mean, how hard is it to figure out that people love gossip? Uh, <laughs> but the, the one I did, I, I wrote a sitcom in China. It went to um, uh, my partner, I, I wrote it on the train. Um, my partner is Chinese when said, I love this, do you mind, can I take it to the TV station? I said, sure, go ahead. Um, and she said, oh, I took it, they really like it. They asked it to meet the writer next Tuesday night, we'll go to dinner. I said, great. So we go there, and I understand enough Mandarin to know that the guy looked at her and went, whoa, I wanted to meet the writer, this is a white guy. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm going, really, do you think? And uh, he goes, no, I, no offense, because it never occurred to me that this was written by anybody other than a Chinese person. Because it was very, it was very insightful. It's it, it, the the theme of it is what happens when you have a society that you know the people and they have incredible economic growth in a very short period of time, and people's social skills don't grow as quickly as their bank account. So that was kind of the underlying theme. So um, he said, "Look, I, I really love the show, but you know we're Communist Party television. We can't put an American writer on." And I went, "Yeah, okay, whatever." And he came back like two weeks later and said, I went to the propaganda department. And they do have the propaganda department. And they know who you are, which of course I figured they knew who I was. And um, they loved the story. And they said, if we want to do it, we can do it. So it became the first time a non-Chinese writer ever wrote a comedy for Chinese television. And that ran um, 70 episodes, 7-0. It was nominated for the Asian TV Awards. It was the only sitcom from China that was nominated that year, which the irony is that the funniest TV show in China is written by a New York Jew. 
Um, I guess in many ways it does make sense. Uh, and uh, so, so we've had a comedy, and now we do reality. So really what we've changed the business model is, it's, it's evolved. Um, so if you're a Broadway producer and you've got an idea for a play, you don't start that play on Broadway. You take it to Connecticut. You, you go off Broadway first. You get the bugs out of it. You make it work. You change the cast and the music and you do all of that. And then when it's ready, you take it to the main stage. You take it to Broadway. Uh, again, because of economics, you don't start with the highest set of economics. You work with the best set of economics. So we just come up with this idea that we could use China to be our Connecticut. And uh, so the first show that we said we'll do is we'll use world-class people to create formats for television shows that could play anywhere in the, in the world, but we'll build them in China, we'll test them in China, that China could be used for more than making coffee cups or chairs or, or anything like that. We can make media um, from it. So the first one we did, um, we're doing, uh, I came up with this idea. I, I'm of the belief the world is now ready for some positive. We've had enough Kardashians. The world needs something positive. I mean, with all the stuff that's going on, people need positive messages. They need inspiration, aspiration. Um, so I could turn out to be crazy, but I said that's the direction I'm going to go in. Um, so I created a show called The Bruce Lee Project. There's no fighting in The Bruce Lee Project. It's all about the philosophies that Bruce stood for. Bruce was totally into be the best you can be. Um, he was an environmentalist before he was cool and stuff, and he's got books on philosophy. Um, so I went to, originally I went to Keanu Reeves, who I knew, and said, you know, Keanu, the Matrix, you're kind of the modern day Bruce. Um, why don't you come into this thing with me? He goes, Larry, I don't do TV, and I'm sorry, I would never do it reality TV. I said, okay, listen to the idea, and you know, I tell him the idea, and he goes, oh shit. I go, oh shit, what? He goes, I was 12 years old, my parents took me to 42nd Street to see this movie called Enter the Dragon. And I looked up at the screen and said, that's what I want to be when I grow up. He goes, I can't say no, I'm in. Um, we went to Shannon Lee, Bruce's daughter, and Shannon said, my father would never want anybody to find the next movie. So we said, no, it's not about that. It's just about your dad's philosophies of life. So Shannon came in. So I brought in, um, just the people who did the, the set design for the boys. Uh, I brought in the engineering company who did the Olympics. I brought in the graphics company who did Mad Men, all world class. So people can't go, oh, that's Chinese junk. Uh, yes, we, we started it in China. So we, we built the format there. And now we've sold that format of the show to 10 other countries. So the, the, that show, so each country has its own local version. So it'll be your local hosts, local contestants, local language, um, and with no sales force. I mean, we haven't hired anybody to do sales. Just the show is so, just so it's such high concept. We've sold it to now India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Dubai, Saudi Arabia, uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, China. Now we're negotiating Brazil with the Philippines. And Things like that. We take sales costs out of the equation. You come up with really nice numbers. Uh, <laughs> you know, you kind of just take 35% and add it back. Uh, so, so we're doing that. So now a bunch of the U.S. companies. Uh, and for us, the reason, one of the reasons we do it is that it's become so difficult in the U.S. to be an independent. I mean, and I choose to be an independent. Uh, people say, "Why don't you go run the studio?" I don't want to run anybody's studio and, and do that. <clears throat> but the cost of piloting a scripted drama is somewhere around $8 million today, okay? So you need to produce about 10 pilots and hopefully you sell one. How many independents could go $8 million in the hole uh, to do it? That's why everything tends to look like that, or it only comes out of the same set of, of minds. So by doing it outside of the country and showing that it works, we maintain ownership throughout the entire process. So we own all our own shows. So, and then, you know, the NBC's, ABC's, they, they license from us. So they pay us for people, we own them. What, um, in one, that Bruce Lee project sounds incredible. Um, and it's, what's amazing to me is what you've done with the business model in China, in a country you didn't know. But what, 
do you maintain that scrappy mindset you had when you were a T, or because now you know you, you're not working off of a two percent raise? You know, resources are probably a little bit differently than in the mid '80s. What has changed for you, if anything, as you jump into this and try these new ventures and this new format? Uh, what has changed for you, if anything? Um, but we still maintain that, that same mindset. Uh, we think of ourselves as a startup, we operate as a, we don't let that change us. So we don't approach it differently, but we, our money is unlimited and we can do that. And a lot of people come to us thinking that we know more than we actually do know. And they go, oh, what's the next venture? We'll give you money. Uh, and sometimes money is, hurts you. It stops you from thinking creatively and, and being inventive and finding new ways. So we like to go through those periods where we got to figure out how to make it work on what we've got. So we don't take in outside financing. Um, everything we do is out of our own pocket. So, And you think differently when it comes out of your pocket. When you said that there, I, I hope everyone caught, you know, the absence of money forces you to think creatively. That is, if there's a golden nugget to this entire evening, I hope it's the reality of that, right? Because that forces you to think differently. Okay, but right now, um, what excites you right now in technology and media and transportation and anything that you're seeing out there? What is exciting to you right now? Um, well, I, I just think there's, well, I, I love technology and stuff, and I've never been one to hold on to the past. I mean, I don't relish the music of the 80s or anything. I'm always looking for what's next and stuff like that. And I think, you know, particularly U.S. companies have had this problem trying to hang on, they fight to hang on to what is instead of realizing what's inevitably going to come. Like the music industry took a long time and you know, you never would have had a Netflix if HBO didn't fall asleep and think we're going to just fight this and stuff and you're not going to win. At the end of the day, the consumer, the consumer wins. Um, so for us, uh, we're, we're always looking for what's next, the things that excite me. Uh, we've been looking at virtual reality. Um, we think a lot of people have their head up their butt on virtual reality. Just because technology allows you to do something doesn't mean you should do it, but doesn't mean that you're gonna do it successfully. So, you know, I get probably two calls a week from tech companies that say, could you do some demoware for our VR company? And I go, let me guess, you want me to do a basketball game? They go, yeah, that would be really good. I go, no, I don't do basketball. They go, how about a concert? I go, let me make sure I get this straight. I go to a concert, I wanna watch the band. You want me to create an experience where I could watch my neighbor pick his nose? I said, I don't get it, no. Um, so, I mean, there's just a lot of bad ideas um, that are out there. But there are a lot of good ideas. You know, for VR, um, you, you know, to do real estate kind of stuff, there's lots of ways that VR can, can be profitable. And I, I love it as a technology. Um, you know, I think when you combine it with, with AI and stuff like that, the, the implications are, are limitless. The thing that I'm really excited about these days, I love holograms. Um, I love holographic stuff. Not so much for entertainment, but for education. Um, I'm working on something now. I'm on the board of the Einstein Foundation, uh, which is unfortunate my mother's not alive, uh, because when I used to come up with all my crazy ideas, my mother would always hit me in the head and say, shut up, you know Einstein. Um, <laughs> you know, now, now I'm on the board. Um, <laughs> But, um, you know, and say, okay, the college experience, you go into, you know, the, the lecture hall and there's some boring professor teaching you about physics. I said, I could create Einstein as a hologram. And I could put Einstein in a thousand lecture halls across the world. And I could take the best teachers and the biggest experts in any, and literally anything. And I could have them present educational experiences, which would certainly be much more interesting to the students and, and get people kind of, I mean, I would go see Einstein teach physics um, and stuff. So, so the whole thing of holograms, so we're looking at first for education, second for uh, entertainment kind of experiences. So aside from that board of are you investing or advising in any startups in any particular industry or? Yeah, um, I, I do a little bit of angel. I don't, I don't do a lot because I just don't really have time to study and uh, I'm of the mind that uh, it, it's crazy thinking, but if I invest in something, I always look and go, okay, if you get hit by a bus, do I really want to take over that com company? And the answer is no. Uh, 
But you know, we do it, we do it sometimes so where it's complimentary. We, we actually just started a, a film fund for independent filmmakers. Because I, I think the, how many superhero movies, you know, could be, everything's a Marvel film. I mean, I can't watch it anymore. Um, so really, it's dried up for small films. So we started a fund where if you want to make an independent film outside of the studio system, we've created a financing vehicle that will allow that. Uh, and we literally just started that uh, a few weeks ago. So that's just, just getting in. That's fantastic, Larry. And, and you know, just like the clock, and I said, unfortunately, we can't go on forever, but I know we could. So to wrap up, there's so many great things here. What is, there's just one, one last golden nugget to just leave the startup grant community um, as we wrap up. Sure, I mean, it's always, it's actually a difficult thing. It's, it's you, you really have to have a, this belief in what you're doing, and regardless of what people tell you, that you're nuts not to give it up when you still really believe in it. But on the other side of that is really being able to be constantly self-examining and looking at it and going, is every idea I have a brilliant idea? The answer is no. So it's, it's looking at things you're doing and, and not hanging on too long. It's the ability to look at stuff and say, you know what, I goofed, I was wrong, it's not what I thought it would be, next. And just not waste your time and stuff. But, but again, if you still believe in it, it's just hang on to it no matter what somebody says to you. That was awesome. Start a grand, let's hear it for Larry Gamer.